Dram watering tools have been the professional's choice for quality and durability for 80 years. Use a Dram rain wand to create the softest shower of rain for your beds and containers. A nine pattern revolver spray gun for a variety of uses or a color storm sprinkler for a lush green lawn and garden. Dram, the professional's choice for lawn and garden. Available at a fine garden center near you. Visit us online at dramm.com. Welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who just simply love plants. But not always the same ones. I'm Carol Collins. I'm Associate Editor at Fine Gardening. Hey, y'all. And I'm Danielle Sherry. I am the Executive Editor at Fine Gardening Magazine. And today, very special guest joining us once again. She is not a stranger to you podcast listeners, but welcome to Christine Alexander, our Digital Content Editor extraordinaire. Hey, Christine. Hello. How you doing? Good. (laughs) so 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 christine is uh christine is in the throes of a lot going on in her life right now but most pointedly you you have quite the event coming up right christine i do uh the wedding that we thought might never happen not because (laughs) of us but because of covid um is uh yeah right on the horizon. It's not this weekend, but the weekend after. And um, my house is a disaster (laughs) (laughs) of, you know, whatever, decorations and whatever, all the stuff for the welcome bags. It's like, you know, six boxes of goldfish. Uh, (laughs) It's just, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy over here, but um, we're very excited. Maybe we should specify, are we talking live goldfish or goldfish <laughs> crackers here? No, yeah, the crackers. Okay, all right, good. Crackers. Well, listen, I, I know your husband. I would not be surprised if it was live goldfish. No, yeah, we, <laughs> no, I did, I um, dissuaded him from giving those as, as favors. Yeah, okay. no. <laughs> or, right. no, these are the, the little snackies people get in their hotel rooms. So, perfect, yeah. <laughs> perfect. Well, thank you for taking time out to join us, but we would have been very remiss to not include you in as the special guest on this episode because two years ago when this this great wedding extravaganza was going to happen, you, against my advice, against Carol's advice, against everyone's advice, grew your own flowers for yes, for the beer. wedding yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so with today's episode being best plants for cutting flowers or best cutting flower plants however you want to say it we thought hey you'd be the perfect person to ask well <clears throat> i don't know about that <laughs> <laughs> as i am actually not <laughs> using any flowers i have grown in the bouquets <laughs> But I did uh, learn a lot. And so that was, yeah, I'd be happy to share what I did learn. Of course, none of those plants are on my list either. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's all right. That's yeah. all right. Well, That's Carol, all right. I'll ask you, were you, uh, were you, did you find it difficult to come up with cutting garden flowers or flowers for cutting? Because you, you actually grow quite a few annuals for that purpose. Is that correct? I, yeah, I grow a lot of annuals and mostly they stay in the garden, but I don't have a distinct cutting garden. The whole garden is a cutting garden on a given day, right? You can, you go out, you forage around and find what looks good and what looks good together. Um, So that's sort of my approach. I just had trouble narrowing it down to like, you know, what would I recommend other people to grow? Ditto, ditto. Yeah, that was kind of the approach I took. I do not have a cutting garden. I don't grow a ton of annuals, particularly to be cutting garden flowers. But I was really inspired. A lot of years ago, I got to go out and visit a garden that was out in Squim, Washington. And it was an author of ours, Catherine Mix. And we have a an article on, on finegardening.com from her. And her cutting garden, quote unquote, that she does a cut flower business out of, 
is just looks like a beautiful garden. You know, it's filled with trees and shrubs and annuals and perennials. And, you know, it's kind of inspiring to me of, you know, all right, yeah, you can plant plants thinking you'll cut from them, but it doesn't need to be just a, you know, row after row after row of annuals, that type of thing. So, well, all right. With that said, Carol, what was the first plant that you kicked off with? So the first one that I want to talk about is an annual, and it is one that a lot of people grow as a cutting flower. In fact, it got an endorsement from the Association of uh, Specialty Cut Flower Growers. And that Who knew that existed? (laughs) You know, you think about it, these folks really need to have things that they can count on to have nice, strong stems and good color and not die from disease, right? Yeah, their livelihood depends on it. Exactly. So if they give this the thumbs up, then I, you know, that's sort of what prompted me to start growing it. And this is Benary's Giant Zinnias, and it's a series. Mm. They have multiple colors. Um, it's a Zinnia elegans uh, cultivar, and uh, it gets like, I I think it can get tall, like three to five feet tall is what I would say. They are giant. They are big and yeah. about two feet wide, so not as wide as it is tall. Um, you could grow these in a row in, you know, your vegetable garden and use it just as a cut flower. I mix it into beds for a good pop of color. Nice. And I got uh, the mix from Johnny's and a lot of people carry it and a lot of people carry the individual colors if you're looking for a very specific color. Um, the colors are amazing. Deep red, orange, carmine rose, coral, mm. lime, wine, purple, bright pink, white, salmon, scarlet, and golden yellow. Um, in wow. my packet of 50 seeds, I didn't get all of those to grow, but it's they all kind of go well together, which is nice. Um, and if you really hate the cool pink and you don't feel like it's going with the rest of the colors, cut it out of there. And uh, we're, 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 so, okay. we're so anti-pink here on this podcast, I feel like. Well, there's a warm pink and a cool pink. And my thought was they didn't look great right next to each other. But in your color scheme and someone else's color scheme, you never know. But yeah. um, when you get the mix, you get to see a sampling and then maybe you hone in the next year. I did find this year that some of these colors were unavailable. Oh, so wow, I think okay. it varies from year to year. Um, full sun, good garden soil, keep them watered. Uh, they, they resist the powdery mildew that a lot of zinnias get. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, but they don't, I mean, they're not immune by the end of the year, they're going to start looking a little powdery. And then, and then again, you can just cut them right to the ground. They're done and, or let them decay naturally, whatever, yeah. whatever looks right to you. Carol, talk to me about size of zinnia, because I feel like zinnias come in everything from dime sized all the way up to, you know, half the size of a basketball, for goodness sake. So for the flower where, head. Right. Yeah. What what size does a flower head fall into? I would say about five or six inches wide. Okay. And, they, you know, the the first flowers are a little more single. The later flowers are a little more double. OK, but just really a classic sort of zinnia look. And, you know, again, the nice, strong, sturdy stems that you really need for cutting. That's awesome. Christine, have you ever grown zinnias? Uh, I haven't. Uh, My neighbor across the way has like their entire front yard is is zinnias and they're they're It's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, So I'm a fan, but. I would feel weird if I started growing them. <laughs> like, it's definitely, they claimed it. So, yeah. You don't want to be a copycat. Don't want to be no, a copycat. No, I've got to do, I've got to find my own thing. So, yeah. I haven't, I haven't grown a ton of the upright, tall, quote unquote, cutting, cut and come agains or anything like that zinnias. I usually do the short little profusion zinnias that are, you know, more ground covery, kind of pillowy. I, I I usually go with those, but those make great cuts too, um, even though the stems are a lot shorter. But yeah, zinnias, it seems like you can't go wrong as far as a cutting flower is concerned. All right. So if you don't grow zinnias, Christine, what do you have on your list as a first plant? First plant. Okay. So my first plant is um, 
uh, an Asian lily, an oriental lily. Mm -hmm. um, the variety I picked, though I have a few different ones, is Stargazer. Mm -hmm. um, and these were a present. I know you guys just did a podcast on plants to give as gifts, and these mm -hmm. were um, from my future mother-in-law. Uh, she had her bullies were just going out of control. So she ended up dividing them and giving us a bunch of bulbs, which was awesome because they were like established. And so they came in really strong. Um, and I hadn't grown uh, lilies before. And I was like, not, you know, I just didn't know what to expect. And I was, I was like, I remember just so amazed that like, first of all, just how beautiful the flowers are and um, the fragrance, you know, yeah. Um, and so I don't know how unusual a pick this is, but, um, for me, it was, it was a really cool experience to, to be given these and then sort of like surprise, you know, there's these like really kind of lush, you know, many bloomed tall plants that, um, that I got to enjoy. Um, so Yeah. So where did you end up planting these guys as far as conditions are concerned? I, I'm, I, are you in full sun, part shade? What are we looking at for conditions for stargazer lilies? Sure. Yeah. Um, so they are in our front, along our front of the house <laughs> <laughs> and, um, they do get, they do get a decent amount of sun there. Um, what I am told and what we kind of, you know, did not really intentionally was um plant them behind some shrubs some rhododendrons um kind of in between so it turns out i guess lilies like to have maybe like a cool a cool um bottom of the plant yeah <laughs> they like their feet cold is what i read yeah, yeah and they like their head warm so we we did that and we got some really nice i think they were about like 4 or 5 feet tall that's incredible um, and the and the soil you know is nothing exciting it's you know definitely well drained but um you know it's not i wouldn't you know we're definitely not in there you know putting compost in every all you know, all the time i think um i've also read and you guys can maybe confirm that lilies are generally maybe not that picky about about soil um well i think drained. you nailed it well drained yeah 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 because yeah. yeah. they are that bulb that if you know you've got clay or something that really holds that water those bulbs will rot out on you and that's that's a bummer yeah yeah so we but i thought you know the, so with with the plants i chose as sort of like a whatever setting the stage. I think I did this last time too. I like, I like have a theme <laughs> to talk about. Um, most of the plants I chose have pretty big blooms, mm -hmm. mostly because if you don't have a ton of space to grow like a lot of different varieties, I think it's nice to get, you know, just sort of, you know, a, a plant that produces a lot of blooms that you can have cut flowers. And I tried to find things that bloomed for a long time mm -hmm. um, so that you could kind of enjoy it over, over the season. So that was the case for me with, with these guys. Um, they bloom for a while. Um, I, you know, you can decide if you want to cut just the, um, the stalk or the stem. Um, and, what I ended up doing a lot of time was just actually, uh, I'm not sure how, which one would be which, but the, the flower stem that was connected to the stalk, I guess I would often cut that alone, mm -hmm. um, which ends up being short. It's like a three or four inch, right? Like whatever, um, uh, stem, but you can, and I sometimes would, like tie that to like a stick or something else so I could give it a little bit more height in my bouquets. Nice. Um, but you can also, if you're growing this specifically for a cut flower, you know, you're growing a lot of them, you can cut the stalk. Although you don't necessarily want to cut a lot of the stalk because you want the plant to still be able to, you know, get energy and have leaves and things like that so that the, the bulb doesn't die off for the next year. So, um, so do you leave this in the ground? Is it hardy in our, in our zone over the winter? Yeah. Yes. So I, uh, it is hardy. Um, and what I read is that it's hardy from three to nine. That's a nice zonal range on it. Yeah. So, so 
Carol, uh, Tom Hobbs, in our recent article that's about to come out on suburb bulbs, had a lily tip, didn't he? On like, if you go in and cut the stems, like, and now leave I can't a, remember leave the a ratio. Third. He said leave to, a third. Okay. Leave a third of the greens, like Christine said, it helps recharge the plant. Nice, nice. So third. Okay. So for everybody that four foot stock, you know, do the math, third of it, leave behind. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> As, yeah. The only other thing I would say about the these is because people, I, I think, no, but they, they are toxic. So if you, you know, especially with cats, like be careful. Um, and the other thing I would say is the like little pollen postules when you cut them i don't know what you like the actual like scientific term is but you can pick those off yeah um and i would because they are very messy they will 100 percent stain your tablecloth <laughs> yes 100 yeah. and everything yes. else so um yeah and i guess the only other thing was when you, you can cut them when they are like partially open and that's um and that's okay for these guys and they'll they'll open that's awesome. And so, and these. again, this is stargazer lily, correct? Stargazer lily, yep. Beautiful, beautiful. I will say, yeah, when uh, I worked for a florist for a short period of time that was attached to a garden center nursery, it was a lot. But um, yes, picking out those anthers with yes. all the pollen on it was essential. And uh, I just remember my boss saying like, oh my God, can you imagine if a bride was wearing, you know, her yes. wedding dress and it just stained everything yellow. Yeah. Bad, bad scene, bad scene. No tip there. So yeah. No, <laughs> no. Well, so Christine, I, I picked up on your theme and I thought, all right, you know what? I'm going to do a theme. I'm going to do my favorite bouquet to make from my garden this time of year. And um, so it starts off, you know, uh, so I'm looking at mid to late spring here. And my first plant for my little three plant bouquet is a grape hyacinth, which I don't think you often think of, you know, as a cut flower, but that's a uh, mousse, uh, mousse Muscari, there we go. I can do it. Muscari, <laughs> <laughs> our maniacum, which is zones three to nine. I think everybody pretty much knows what a grape hyacinth looks like, so I don't really need to describe it. You know, grassy foliage, but it will, when it sends up that little, you know, puff ball, you know, scoop of ice cream looking little guy of flowers that's bluish purple, the stems really are long. Like if you dig your like little snips down into the base of that grass, you will often get a stem that's eight inches or so. So, you know, for a small little mason jar or, you know, a smaller little bouquet, it does the trick, you know, and I like your idea tie a stem, tie a stick to it, or, you know, one of the, the bamboo skewers that you use on the grill just to give it a little bit more height. But um, I just love it. It's got a thin, sturdy stem. Um, it really is a nice filler flower, if you will. And that blue, I mean, there's nothing like it. It's just so gorgeous and clear. And it lasts for a really long time in a vase. Now, I've got some that are downstairs that I picked and we're going on week two as of tomorrow that they've just been hanging out in my vase, still going strong. So I feel like if you're getting two weeks out of a flower in a vase, that's pretty darn good. Um, as I said, mid spring to late spring um, is usually when you can count on these guys to, to uh, do their thing and start blooming. And there's all different varieties of muscari. You know, there's fragrant ones. There's a yellow one called pineapple that's just really adorable, which is purple and yellow, and you get that pineapple-y fragrance. But um, I just stuck with the straight standard, you know, muscari for this for this uh, recommendation. And uh, yeah, the only thing I'll say is that they really do, because they're a bulb, and this is something that you would plant in the fall and would bloom in the spring, um, you need well-drained soil, just like the lilies. Um, you know, if you don't have them in well-drained soil, you can count on them being little mushy bulbets by the end of your first season. Um, so yeah, so that's great. Python, Muscari, Armeniacum, zones three to nine. Full sun to part shade too. This is not one that needs full crazy sun. But um, so that's the first flower I'm putting into my base. How, how do you get them? Because when I've had them in a vase, they often will, they're very top heavy for me. 
Is that, would you have tips for that? Well, so, so that's kind of my filler flower. So if I did that alone, I would probably like trim the stems really, really short. So that, you know, they're just kind of being held up by the rim of the stem okay. of the vase, yeah. but I'm going to throw some other things generally gotcha. in the vase. You know, you got your big bolts, you got your kind of filler flowers. And then usually I throw in some sort of woody for structure. So I'll do my woody gotcha. next. <laughs> okay. Okay. I like it. Oh, I get it. <laughs> cool. All right, Carol. First up was an annual. What do you got up next for us? Woody, perennial. I've got a perennial for this oh, one. Yeah. All right. And, Surprise uh, me. It's a little dangerous looking in a bouquet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what I've got is blue glitter sea holly. And Whoa. that's an eryngium planum, blue glitter. And it is one of the hardier sea hollies. It it is hardy from zones four to nine. Uh, It gets like three feet tall, two feet wide, sort of middle of the border. It does not love to be crowded. It likes full sun, really well-drained soil. And it will actually spread best if you have light, sandy soil. Um, You will get it to multiply a little better than if you're in heavy clay, where it would probably sulk. You know, Mm -hmm. think of it, it it tolerates... uh, salt spray so you know it could be near the sea it could be near you know a salty road um tolerates poor soil you can yeah and yes yeah exactly (laughs) great that's mostly what i have Mm -hmm. um in fact actually too much water or too much fertility in the soil will make it flop and you'll have to support it and um mulch it doesn't really love a lot of mulch let it be dry and, you know, in like just the worst soil you have. But, so abuse um, it is what you're saying. Abuse this plant. It thrives on neglect. Thrives on neglect. <laughs> okay. It doesn't really want a lot of playmates in the same like area with it. I um, like it. But I just love the look of this. It has got these like sort of, uh, it's, it's like an oval thistle-like flower with a little collaret of, of, um, Oh gosh, what do you call them? Bracts around the mm. around the base of it, sort of like Kermit the Frog's little spiky collar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is the best description yeah. and, ever. I I have it in my head. Now. <laughs> it's oh, not wow. green though. It is like a silvery blue, and the more sun it gets, the bluer it'll be. Um, and the stems are really silvery. They also have the blue. It comes up from a base of uh, like a rosette of foliage at the ground. Um, you can cut right after this one goes by, you can cut it right back to that basal foliage. And if you want it in a bouquet, same deal, cut it back as much as you want. Um, it will not hur- harm it at all for next year's show. Um it does not look great when it goes by. So that's why I'm like, this is a great cut flower. Cut it and enjoy it when it's at its peak because once it starts going brown, unlike some other things that look good as seed heads, I don't think this one <laughs> looks particularly oh, okay. good um, as seed heads. It looked just, you know, brown and crispy. Okay. <laughs> um, but the hotter and drier the site you have, the happier this plant will be. That's awesome. Now, Carol, do you have this in your garden currently, or is this a wish list plant? Now, this one I I am growing, and it's sort of mixed in with um, other prairie plants like penstemons, and Mm -hmm. I mix a few annuals in, but again, I try not to crowd it too much. Okay. All right. Wow. Yeah. And how cool in a a bouquet. I mean, that, that is a... It's not a big, bold focal point, but I bet you it attracts a lot of attention in a bouquet just because it looks so kind of gnarly. Yes, I'm and, and getting, ex- <laughs> I'm getting excited because it's in my bouquets. Oh, oh, is it? You have that one? Oh yeah, my gosh. That Perfect. one's going to be because the, the um, groom, groomsmen are wearing blue. And so we wanted a little pop of blue in the bouquets. And this is... This is what we chose. So I'll have to send you guys pictures. Well. Nice. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. How like, beautiful. I like, oh my God. <laughs> and that's your something blue. So you don't have to worry. Yeah. Oh my God. Perfect. Oh, this is, I need, <laughs> thank See, we're, you. We're checking off wedding <laughs> checklists right now. Yeah. We're checking it off. That's amazing. That's, that's very cool. Well, Christine, so, so that is in your bouquet, but what is on your list next for your next flower? Sure, 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 sure. Um, okay. So I 
went with <laughs> um, Limelight Hydrogen. Yes. Yes. Um, I, know, I, know, I know. It's not, you know, none of these, I assume none of these are going to be, um, what's the word, like, I, whatever. I, 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 these aren't, like, very far out choices, but I think limelights are so beautiful. Um, I was reading, we had a paniculata, hydrangea paniculata trial, uh, that article that Richard Hockey had done. And, and it, it was one of the ones that scored the highest. It's just like, uh, an amazing variety of hydrangea, right? So yeah, so it's a paniculata. Um, it's, in terms of like description, I'm not sure many people haven't seen one, but um, they get big. They can get six to 10 feet big and wide from what I've read. Um, and yeah, uh, grow again, like kind of a large range, a zonal range, like three to nine is what I'm reading. So mm-hmm. again, um, listeners confirm or, <laughs> or, or debunk this if, if you've tried it and it hasn't worked for you. But um one of the reasons I really like limelights is because they they have a long uh, bloom season. It's like midsummer to late fall, and if you've seen one, you know that the flowers bloom in this sort of like very light kind of lime slash white, um, you know, if like what's the word, a fusion of of these you know, kind of um, big, almost like like football sized. Um, They're huge. Yeah. Some of them right? can get gigantic. The, the flowers. Yeah. So, but, um, so they, they start out this sort of white lime and then throughout the season, as you get later into fall, they change tones into this sort of maybe darker uh, green and pink and, um, and, and, you know, with like hints of, you know, like, chocolate I don't know trying to make brown sounds <laughs> sounds appealing <laughs> but um yeah it's just I think it's such a cool plant and I love that it evolves and you can dry it and I know Danielle you did the hydrangea wreath I think were those limelight those were yeah yeah, yeah. the video we have a video on the website where um Danielle explains how to make a, a beautiful uh, wreath with with these blooms so um yeah, full sun to part shade. Where I've seen these do really nicely is morning sun up until, you know, the afternoon. And then they kind of come into partial shade. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think uh, in general, hydrangeas are recommended to be full sun, but a lot of them actually do like, okay, or maybe prefer a little bit of shade. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Nodding yeah. heads. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. And yeah, I mean, another cool thing like with with the blooms, right, is because they can dry and dry really gorgeously, they can last in a vase and you can keep them. And because I'm me, I often don't change out the flowers in a vase for a long time. Um, it's kind of nice that they will, that they'll dry up and, and kind of stay um, with their form. Yeah, that's that's such a good one. I I would go so far as to say uh, most panicle hydrangeas are just a great cut flower. But, you know, especially with panicles because they bloom on new wood. So when you're going in there and you get a little carried away and you're hacking and you're making bouquets for everybody, you know, it's not going to be detrimental and it's not going to set your blooms back next year. It it doesn't matter. It's not like, you know, you're going in there and you're hacking away at it and you're sacrificing some blooms for the next year if you continue to pick into the fall. So yeah, Yeah. big, big fan, big fan. Yeah. They're so pretty. They are. They definitely (laughs) are. And, and it is cool too, because you can, you can pick them before they, you know, those fertile florets really unfurl. You can, kind of get them when they're a contained little ice cream cone. And then mm-hmm. as you bring them in, they kind of flower out and yeah, flush pink and then freeze dry themselves in the vase, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Awesome mm-hmm. too. Yeah. That's a so, good pick. Good pick. Thank you. There, I do have, there was one interesting thing I had read, which, and I'm curious about this, if this is a myth we can debunk. That, <laughs> <laughs> right. <Uh-oh>. <laughs> that <laughs> Well, So I was reading that, um, you know, because they can and will eventually turn like pretty brown, 
right? Uh, if you keep them on the plant, mm-hmm. that a way to keep them from doing that would be to overhead water and that that keeps, I guess, the, the flowers moist so that they don't brown up as fast. What do you guys think about this? Mm. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of overhead water. Yeah. yeah. It seems like it's Thing. just going to invite some fungal disease yeah. into the equation. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, I thought that was a little suspect. But, um, I but mean, maybe only, if you were on a cut flower farm, maybe they'd have some kind of procedure to, ex- I don't know. but and, yeah. and it would be like in fall, not the whole time. I think it's once, oh. once the, the plant has mostly been spent. But um but yeah i just hmm. i'll experiment i'll let you guys I'll, yeah please do report, guys know report yes. back on that report back on that um okay so my next one is a woody plant as well and um it's eternal fragrance daphne this is daphne transatlantica balfra which is zone six to nine and um I picked this because you guys got to see this plant recently. We had a fine gardening outing out at uh, the summer cottage that my family owns. And it's a weird microclimate in Connecticut. So we're able to kind of push, do some zone busting there. And this this Daphne, this particular Daphne has been there for many, many years. Um, And let's be honest, Daphne's I'm sorry. I think they're super hard to grow. It's an expensive plant that I have killed numerous times. <laughs> so I'm not going to be planting a Daphne unless it's this Transatlantica, which is, it's a hybrid and it's a cross between two different Daphnes, um, one grown for fragrance, which is a Daphne um, Odora, and then one that was grown for its hardiness, which now it escapes me which species this was. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. All right. So eternal fragrance, this kind of gives you an idea. This is a, a very fragrant vanilla baby powder mixture. I, I, I think that's how I would describe the scent, but you know, scent is, scent is very particular to the person. So uh, this is an evergreen, which is kind of cool. It has tiny lance shaped dark, dark green foliage on these sort of succulenty looking stems. And this mass is out to a two to three foot tall and wide little shrub. And it just smells so gosh darn good. And once it gets established, it starts blooming in early spring. It goes all the way through spring into early summer. And then the big flush of blooms is kind of over, but then it'll flower sporadically through summer and into fall as well. Now, you know, that's not the whole bush covered, but enough to do a little picking here and there. Um, It's really, really cool as a cut flower because it's got those, you know, woody stems. So it kind of gives you bulk in the vase, but then the flowers are tiny tubes that are white with a pink outer uh, petal and they cluster themselves together at the tips of the stem. So that really makes it worthy for a vase. You know, it's not, these flowers aren't hiding in the depths of the shrubs. So you're really hacking away at the shrubs. You can just do tip cuttings on them. Um, and generally I cut, you know, six to eight inches again, cause it's going in the vase and then I'm putting in my little grape hyacinths, Christine. So that's going to hold my grape hyacinths upright. Yeah, got it. So, uh, are so good at explaining what plants look like. like <laughs> well, I mean, we've been on the podcast for about, I don't know, 112 episodes. We yeah. both like really paint a beautiful, like a picture. I'm like, wow, I can, like, <laughs> I could look this up, but I'm like, I know what. I know what she's talking. Well, we, we do give reminders, though, too, that, you know, sometimes we don't do the best job. So go on to finegardening.com. Right. <laughs> hit the hit the podcast tab. We put pictures of all the plants we talk about in our show notes. And we always remind people, please do not write down plant names while you're driving. The plant lists are on our website. Please do not do that. Do not get into an accident. We have these listed there. <laughs> yes. Yes. 
So I, the, the big thing with Daphne is make sure it's in partial shade. It doesn't love full sun. It doesn't, it kind of burns out. Those leaves will burn out on you. So it really wants part shade and it wants moist, well-drained soil. And again, that's kind of a difficult condition to come by. But if you've got it, you know, kind of on a, on a slope, um, it usually does pretty well because you're getting that well-drained soil and just make sure that you're amending with a lot of compost. It likes that fertility, but, um, it's, it's a beautiful plant that I would probably grow even if I wasn't using it for cut flowers, but, um, it's just a really, really cool plant. And it's a Daphne that I'm willing to roll the dice on and spend the money. Cause I feel like it's hardier than some other Daphne's and that's eternal fragrance Daphne. It's a Daphne transatlantica. All right, Carol, bring it on home. What do you have as your last flower that's going into the vase? So I thought that I should do at least one filler flower. Mm -hmm. And this one is something that is a perennial, but you can grow it and it would take the place of baby's breath or, you know, it's a, it's a white, white flower, small little flower. So this is a cute name to Peter Cottontail Yarrow. Oh my goodness, oh, do, do not so call this. Sneezewort <laughs> is the alternative common uh, name. And I hate it. And you wouldn't no. want it in a bouquet. And it doesn't make you sneeze. I promise. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this is Achillea tarmica, zones three to eight. So very hardy. Um, it likes full sun, average to dry soil, tolerates poor soil. You can grow it under black walnut trees. It's juggalone resistant. Yeah, um, out. Yeah. That's so cool. Right. And it's a nice size. It gets like two feet tall and wide. Um, the stray species is native to Eurasia. So this is not one of my native plants that I love, but it is a benign non-native. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it is a long bloomer. That's one of the things I love. It blooms from early summer to early fall. And um, it, it looks great the whole time. It's a, a great filler for arrangements. Um and it, it's a great filler in the garden. So you can put it in between, you know, if you have a colorful spot in the garden, you can mix it in with other colors. If you have a white theme going on, looks great with that. Um, just as long as it has full sun, narrow, ferny, deep green foliage, and then speckled with these adorable little white double flowers. And, mm -hmm. you know, like little bunny tails, just so beautiful, cute. adorable. Um, what makes, the, I have, Actually, I don't have this one. What I have is Achillea the Pearl, one of those, you know, older mm -hmm. fashion. This one has the sturdier stems and it has a nice compact habit. And so it is an improvement over what my grandmother grew and what I think I have um, that is also an Achillea Tarmica. Um, and I have good memories, though. These these make a great cut flower in a full size bouquet. But I used to use my grandmother's in Barbie weddings <laughs> oh, because it was like a teeny weeny little white carnations, and so that was my filler plant in Barbie's bouquets and oh decorations God. on the yeah. We did this the whole the thing. Cutest choice. You, yes. you <laughs> went for cutest. Yes, I mean from the name all the way to Barbie weddings. I mean. We're, we should stop the episode now. That's yeah, so you won. <laughs> so, so, Carol, I'm assuming much like other Achilles, is it full sun, uh, well-drained soil, yes. even, you know, grows on the side of highways if you wanted it to type it of It really deal, is. Or? It is so tough. It is so okay. tough. And But the well-drained soil is key, like, for a lot of things. For like a lot of things, it, it, it will rot in soggy, soggy, boggy soil. But other than that, not too fussy. And okay. um, even I think it can even take a little shade. It just won't flower quite as heavily. Okay. So hit me with the botanic name again in your zonal range. Uh, Achillea tarmica in zones three to eight. Very okay. hardy. Awesome. And perfect for Barbie weddings. Perfect. <laughs> perfect for Barbie weddings. Amazing. Uh, all right, Christine, what do you have that's perfect for Barbie weddings? Oh, God. You know what? I don't really. <laughs> you went for um, big and bold. Do you, all do you... <laughs> of my flowers would, would like land on Barbie like the Wizard of Oz house. <laughs> so, like, um, yeah, I don't. <laughs> this is not the appropriate size for Barbie. But um yeah, um, my last uh, pick, my last big flower pick. Okay, so um, dinner plate dahlias. Mm -hmm. I became aware of them because we got a 
GPod submission, which is we have a blog on our website called Garden Photo of the Day, where we this, and everybody, anybody can submit photos to be featured. And so we had a submission that was full of these photos of uh, dinner plate dahlias. And I just was like, I must have that. <laughs> Those are, you know, there's huge flowers. So this one is um, dahlia decorative strawberry ice. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going back to what you were saying, Carol, about like, light pink in the garden i realized that like a couple of my choices are like pretty pretty hot pink to light pink and this one the flowers uh first of all get to be like eight to ten inches in diameter and it's a really beautiful maybe kind of like a darker pink that um fades into lighter pink at the end of the petals there's a little bit of like yellow and orange hints in in the flower too um and yeah, they 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 get tall. You do need to stake these guys. Um, they get pretty top heavy, and um, they so you know they're dahlias. So it says right online that they are hardy <laughs> in zones three to ten. <laughs> But we know that unless you're in zone like eight or higher, you're going to need to, to dig those uh, to dig those bulbs out and overwinter them inside. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, full sun, uh, again, like sticking with the theme, well-drained soil. Um, these are double flower. So that's that's nice. Um, and. Yeah, I mean, I I just think, again, you know, if you're looking to have really kind of big, bold bouquets, you don't want to have to, like, mix and match too much, this one would be a good one to to add into the garden. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I am like, oh, dinner plate dahlias, they are swoon-worthy. They are just swoon-worthy. Never grown them. Carol, you're no. a dahlia grower, though. Have you ever done dinner plates? I do mostly the smaller flowered ones. I accidentally grew one from, I think it was a free tuber somebody gave us. And it's Sam Huston was the name. And I don't know if that one is dinner plate, but it was enormous, like the size of your head. Yeah. I, they're, I wouldn't say that, that these plants are like, you know how like a lot of cut flower plants, like the foliage is kind of like, hmm. yeah. like I, I realized, you know, I'm not really talking about about the plant habit because I don't think that the plants I've chosen are like necessarily, except, you know, maybe the hydrangea are are grown necessarily for their habit. Um, They're definitely, you know, the lily, I mean, the lily at least is like strong stem, you know, can, can be this interest in the back of, of the garden, which is probably where I'd place it because I think it's weird when you just have like, you know, empty space and then like one weird, Lily, yeah, <laughs> but um, but you know this, yeah. I think with this dahlia, it's you're you're not growing it for the foliage; you're growing it for the for yeah. the flower. Um, so my my only recollection of of the leaves is that they they seemed green. They were green and a little bit floppy, <laughs> and I don't have any of the scientific ways to explain them, um, at my disposal. But um. Yeah, I just, again, the other thing, though, with this is that as a cut flower, I think the other ones I've suggested last a little bit longer in a vase. The dahlias, you know, like a week to 10 days, maybe, mm-hmm. if you're not picky about about it, maybe getting a little droopy. Carol, maybe you can weigh in on this because I'm not quite sure, but dahlias hollow stems, right? And hollow stemmed cut flowers tend to not last as long. Is that right, or am I I making that up? I've heard that, too, and um, one trick is to get them right into water as soon as you cut them, like, you know, cut, plunge right into the water, Mm -hmm. and that that sometimes does help, and they take up the water, and it seems like it goes up into the stem a little. Um, There there were also some recommendations, which I've never tried, but maybe you guys have, of scalding the stem in, in super hot water, that that would help them to to last is that is that a thing that's supposed to help them to last or is that to like get rid of like disease or something bacteria that, do you know 
I've heard that for some, I'm, I'm not, I don't know that I've ever tried it. Have you, Danielle? I've, I've done it before with, um, stems that have like, uh, the milky sap, you know, if, if you Um, use like euphorbia, because a lot of times like euphorbia actually is a really cool cut flower, some of them, but, um, the milky stem, what it'll do is it kind of like, it continues to extract itself into the water and it makes it so the flower doesn't last as long, but it also makes the water pretty toxic for the rest of the flowers that you're putting in the vase. So they recommend, you know, you take a lighter to the end of the stem and kind of cauterize it. Basically you can't, you know, you, you, you scald it, but you scald it with that. But I, yeah. And you know, there's some things that they say with, um, you know, when you're forcing branches, you bash the end of the stem, you know, you kind of hit it with a hammer for certain things like cherry blossoms, I think they say. So there are, there are tips and tricks, but, um, yeah, yeah. this, this wouldn't be the, the recommendation was hot water, hot water. Yeah. Mm. Not don't put a lighter. (laughs) Yeah. I, I've never, I have not heard hot water over that, but I know like, you know, a lot of times they say that's, that's good if, you've picked and you haven't put it immediately into water that Mm. that'll open it back up you know for it to be able to to take water up. I mean think of your Christmas tree same concept you know but um yeah interesting hey we should have had Betsy our uh, fine gardening's lovely uh administrative assistant Betsy grows dish dahlias or at least Uh did pretty amazing dish values you would walk by her desk back in the days when we went to the office and she would have in you know late summer oh, these beautiful that. displays of dish values that were oh, just that's like so cool. crazy I'll, good i'll have to talk to her about that yeah they i i think they're beautiful and um oh but one thing i did want to mention before before i sign off or whatever um <laughs> the um you don't want to cut these before they're open. They should be mostly open because mm-hmm. they will they will struggle to open once cut. So that was just oh. you know little, good to know. Tip. Good to know. All right. Well, so you, <laughs> you'll have to circle back with Betsy and ask her about the hot water. And and if we get an answer from Betsy, we'll put it up on the website. How does that sound? Yeah. All right. Sounds good. All right. So in case my my bouquet was not fragrant enough, I'm going to throw a lilac in there because I really want a lilac in there. So we're going fragrant, fragrant, fragrant. Um, I'm just going to say any lilac makes a great cut flower with the caveat of pick it early in the morning. Um, and lilacs generally do better when they're just starting to crack bud. Um, you know, a full bloom lilac generally doesn't last that long in the vase and it'll start to drop pretty quickly. But if you do it as the buds are pretty tight and maybe one or two of those little tiny flowers that makes up the cluster are starting to break, it's a good time to pick those lilacs. Um, and I just went with Miss Kim Korean lilac because I think that that, you know, maybe... A lot of people, I think, would struggle to find the space for an old-fashioned lilac. Um, They get pretty big, 8 to 10 feet tall and wide. They're pretty monstrous. If you've got the room, do it because it's worth it. They're beautiful. But um, Miss Kim is Syringa pubescens subspecies Petula Miss Kim. It's Syringa Miss Kim. I know. it's It's a mouthful. And that botanic name has gone back and forth a bunch of times, but that seems to be where they've landed now. Um, and this is zones four to eight, so a pretty wide zonal range. Um, and this guy only gets four, maybe five feet tall and wide. So, you know, about half the size of a general lilac. Um Lilacs have really beautiful leaves, which we don't often talk about, but they're, you know, kind of an exaggerated long heart shape. Um, It's kind of in between a spade and a heart. That's kind of the shape of the leaf. And it's a bright green, very, very lovely. Um, But honestly, we're talking about the flowers. So with, with the Miss Kim, it's a smaller conical shaped blossom, much like a hydrangea. It's comprised of a lot of tinier little tubular flowers. And Miss Kim is a light purple. You know, it's not that dark royal purple, um, but it's not pink either. It's just this kind of light lavender color. Fragrance wise, I've heard a lot of people say that uh, lilacs and heliotropes have a really similar fragrance profile. So we're talking, you know, kind of in that root beer range. Um, But again, 
you smell what you smell. Uh, if you don't think it smells like root beer, sorry. <laughs> but that's where my mind goes, root beer and fruity pebbles. Um, lilacs will last in, in a vase for a week plus. You know, it depends on how much they've bloomed out when you go to pick them. Um, and full sun to partial shade and well-drained soil. The other thing that I'll say about um, Miss Kim Lilac is just it's um, – it's got uh, mildew resistance. It was bred for resisting powdery mildew, which can oftentimes plague lilacs, especially the old fashioned varieties. You know, you kind of look at it in the same vein as you look at garden flocks, you know, at a certain point in time in summer, you look over and you think it's been, you know, somebody's attacked it with powdered sugar <laughs> that you're not going to see that on the Miss Kim lilac. Um, so again, that's Syringa pubescens subspecies, Petula, Miss Kim and zones four to eight. So I've got my Daphne and I've got my Miss Kim and I've got my little grape hyacinths and together it makes a nice little arrangement. And I'll put a picture of that arrangement that's sitting on my table online in the show notes. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I want to see this. All right. And yeah. smell this. Yeah, <laughs> I want to see this. But I, you know what? I just had a question with the lilac. Yeah. Because how, how long do, do uh, how long does Miss Kim bloom uh, like would you say i would say probably three to four weeks um you're not getting more than a month it's staggered its blooms are staggered so you know it's not like everything flushes all at once um and if you share off those spent blossoms um which i would recommend because you know, much like Carol described earlier, like it goes brown. It, it's not all that attractive. You want to shear it off. You'll get some sporadic rebloom on a lot of the dwarf lilacs. Like Tinkerbell is another one that's pink. That's a dwarf, like Miss Kim. Mm-hmm. So you'll get a little bit of sporadic bloom. But yeah, about three to four weeks is its main is its main main deal in late spring. That that yeah, that's always been my frustration with lilacs and and even. Um higher sense is like the bloom time is so so short and they smell so good and I just really <laughs> want them to last longer <laughs> it's just not fair well but, I will you know. say for that you know what what the these dwarf lilacs have going for them that you know an old-fashioned lilac wouldn't is they're a really attractive yes green meatball but they're a really attractive shrub that is a dwarf shrub that really kind of holds down the fort the rest of the season so even when the blooms are gone it's a decent looking plant you know and now because everything sounds better with a british accent here's peter to talk to us about the trouble he got into with his wife about cut flowers my wife recently pointed out that over our 41 years of marriage i have rarely given her a bouquet of flowers You might be asking yourself, well then, sir, how have you remained happily married for 41 years? And to that I would reply, my wife is apparently a very undemanding person. The remark did, however, leave me a bit dumbfounded. You see, my lack of flower giving was not because I'm the unromantic sort. On the contrary, I'm English, remember, descended from the likes of Wordsworth, Coleridge, Keats, some of the world's most romantic poets. No, my lack of never calling a florist was born from the understanding that my dear wife is a gardener, with a capital G. Given this fact, why would I ever give her plants without roots? Bouquets of flowers die in two weeks or less, and surely that would be an insulting gift to anyone with a green thumb. So, on anniversaries and birthdays, she gets chocolates and fuzzy robes, and occasionally a pair of sturdy gardening gloves. You can't fault me for that now, can you? Apparently, my thinking on this flower front was a bit too practical, though. As my wife explained... Just because she is a gardener, she would still love an occasional bouquet of lovely long-stemmed roses, with the thorns thoughtfully removed by an experienced florist, of course. But I'm still bristling at the thought of buying something for her with a finite shelf life. So, I'm going to take some advice from this episode and buy her a rose bush next week that she can cut blossoms from to her heart's content. Because, despite what she's told me, I'm guessing my wife likes her roses with some thorns. After all, she did marry me. Well, it sounds like Peter got himself into quite a pickle with his wife over cut flowers. Maybe he'll uh, take some of our advice and buy her a plant that can be used as cut flowers. She would like that, I think. I think she would, too. What do you think, Christine? I mean, I would, so. (laughs) (laughs) Who would? Advice for future marital bliss. Yes, exactly. Exactly. 